Thanks for having me on. I'm uh, excited to get started here. Like Faith said, I just started in June and we had a great drought for the topic at hand. Um, so got some good pictures here. Um, so my topic is restarting your lawn after the drought. Um, I do want to mention also that we um, have been upgrading the UK Turfgrass website. So related issues to drought, reestablishing your lawn, um, several other things are on there and it's continuing to be updated. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out, but also check that website. Um, so I want to start off here by just uh, saying growing turf grass in the state of Kentucky is not easy to do. And that's not just my opinion. Um, longtime turf grass scientist here at UK, uh, AJ Powell has a famous quote where he said, we can grow all grasses equally poor in the transition zone. Um, and then also a book uh, called Turf for Golf Courses from 1917 um, from across the pond in England, Piper and Oakley said, most American lawns become hopelessly deteriorated within five or six years in spite of better care than English lawns. Um, so as you see there, the common opinion is that being in the transition zone and here in Kentucky, uh, we deal with a lot of extremes, the cold of the winter and the drought of the summer. Um, so growing grass, having a nice lawn is something that does require management. Um, so I think starting out with this talk is, uh, you know, so much with turf grass, it, it's determine your desires. Um, so I think you have to determine what you want, whether that's a low input lawn that's just alive, uh, it's not dirt, or, you know, that's a high input lawn like this uh, fancy 4th of July American flag decoration here in this lawn. Um, so neither one of those are bad. A low input lawn doesn't have to look bad. Uh, a high input lawn doesn't always look great, um, but there, there's a whole range there and you need to figure out what your use is, whether that is, you know, using it every day, you've got kids out kicking soccer balls, riding bikes, um, you know, tossing football, all of that on it every day, or it's just, uh, it's a fenced in backyard, nobody sees it, uh, you just want it green and that's all you want. Um, so I would say you wanna manage your grass in a way that meets your desired use the most days of the year. Um, so if you use it in the summer, a, a good warm season grass is a possible option, um, but most of the state is a cool season grasses where you have the most use throughout the year. Um, and so when we talk about managing the grass and we talk about specifically recovering from drought stress, um, we are talking about managing the growth of the grass. Um, once you have an established lawn, once you have drought stress, what you're doing is managing the growth, whether that is too fast or too slow to get that desired lawn that you have. Um, so when it comes to managing the growth of the grass, there's four main factors that control the growth. Uh, the first one is being light. The second one is being temperature. The third one being water and the fourth being nitrogen. Um, so I got those from a little book called The Grammar of Greenkeeping by Michael Woods. Um, so when we talk about those four factors, um, we kind of make it simple. So all, all turf grass issues um, can essentially be, you know, narrowed down to one of these four issues being a limiting factor of, of the, the rate of growth. Um, so the first two factors, we really don't have to worry about um, the un uncontrollable factors. Um, the first one is light. We really can't control it. Uh, the sun comes up when it comes up. It goes down when it goes down. Um, we, we live where we live. There's very little that you can do to control that. Um, you know, cutting down a tree that's causing too much shade, um, but that's typically not ideal. Um, so, and the second factor is temperature. There's very little that we can do to control the temperature. Uh, it's gonna be 90 degrees today here in Lexington, and there's nothing I can do to change that. So we make it easy out of the four factors that control the growth, there's only really two of them that we can, can control, and that's water and fertility, uh, nitrogen specifically. Um, but just for fun, are they completely uncontrollable? Uh, no. So you see here, this is the Kansas City Chiefs Stadium, 
and they have artificial growth lights on the football field and they have the grass covered by turf like it. Um, so they're controlling the, the rate of growth by uh, adjusting the temperature with the blankets and giving it artificial light um, with, the, with the grow lights there. Um, but I don't think many uh, folks are gonna be using that in their home lawn. Um, so out of the four factors, the two controllable factors are water and nitrogen. Um, so we can water to, to uh, restart our lawns from growth and we can fertilize to increase that growth rate. Um, so when it comes to the first one um, of water, you have, you have one option that I think everybody needs to do if you wanna keep a lawn. Um, and that is when you get drought stress, um, you know, like we had here really the whole month of June in the state of Kentucky pretty broadly, um, is that you want to water to keep the grass alive. Um, and so you see here the lawn on the left is almost completely dormant. There's hardly any green in there at all. Um, but that lawn was never watered and it has recovered. Uh, that's here locally in Lexington. Um, so there was no need to put water because in the state of Kentucky, we very rarely go over 30 days without rain. And I do remember I was working on a golf course in September 2019, and we got 0, 0.00 inches of precipitation in 2019. Um, and that, that was hard. But uh, typically, you're, you're not going to go over 30 days. But if you do, um, especially with bluegrass lawns, with ryegrass, um, and even some fescues, you do want to consider the water to keep the grass alive. Um, but the other option is to maintain color and vigor. Um, so you would want to water your lawn to maintain your desired results. So if you want to have a really nice 4th of July party this year in Kentucky, um, you would have had dry, crispy grass if you hadn't been watering it. Um, so you can control the growth of the grass with water, providing adequate um, soil moisture. Um, so this lawn here on the right is nice and green. Um, and, and you can see that they've got a sprinkler system. They're probably watering quite a bit, um, but neither one is wrong if, if you use them wisely and you just water to maintain your desired result. Um, but both of these lawns live, uh, they, they'll live through the summer and the one on the left will come back uh, with adequate rainfall. So that's a, a main driving factor is your water. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that when we're going through a drought and we're talking about recovering from a drought is that you um, want to minimize the amount of traffic um, to reduce damage from the drought on the grass. So during periods of drought, you want to reduce mowing, any kind of vehicles, and even foot traffic during prolonged periods of drought. Um, and, you know, they do the same thing. I was reading an article this morning about the forages, you know, when your grazing animals are out there in drought, they don't want them, you know, walking across and eating the, the um, turf that's under stress. So the pasture's under stress. And the same thing goes for your turf grass in your yard. Um, so if you have, you know, a bunch of kids running around on it, using it, it may be a good idea to provide a little water because you can see here the tire track from where somebody um, was driving through drought stress, the grass is green back up after a rain but you see dead turf there from, from the traffic. Um, so the next factor that we can control out of the four, um, can't control light, can't control temperature, we can do water. And once you've provided adequate water, um, adequate to uh, raise the soil moisture, you can use nitrogen to help you recover from drought stress. Um, so now in the month of July, we've got quite a bit of rain here. Um, in the state and most lawns are starting to recover as the soil moisture came back in. Uh, the turf is going out of dormancy and starting to green up. I know some folks are saying, you know, it's just like spring. I'm mowing, you know, twice a week now again um, with all the rain we've gotten in certain parts of the state. So um, another thing you can do to control the growth to recover is to fertilize with nitrogen. Um, but I'll say, do not fertilize dormant turf grass. Um, you're just wasting your money. Um, the grass is not growing, so it's not going to do you any good to fertilize a dormant turf grass. You want to first, you know, look at the limiting factor on what's what's controlling the growth. 
So a limiting factor during the drought would be water. You need to first provide water. And at that point, once the grass starts to grow, you can use nitrogen to uh, thicken the lawn up to promote recovery. Um, so some tips for fertilizing is, you know, we hear over and over again, don't guess soil test. Um, so absolutely soil test, send your soil uh, to your county agents, get those reports and see um, what the recommendations are there. But as you get your report, you notice that there's not nitrogen on the test. Um, so you're going to have to use some, some wisdom and some tips on when you apply nitrogen to your grass. Um, typically, you know, you'll see recommendations from one to two pounds a year or something like that on there. Um, but my recommendation is always to apply small doses. Uh, you can always add more nitrogen, but you can't take it away. So especially as, you know, we've got some recovery now, we've got green grass, um, but it's still 90 degrees, it's still 95 degrees and hot. Um, and the weather that we have right now, you can really uh, risk burning the turf grass by applying too much nitrogen. Um, and you can see in this picture here where somebody, it looks like spilled a bag of fertilizer on the ground and it burnt the grass down to the root. Um, so the grass all around it is, is nice and green. But if you over apply nitrogen, uh, it can burn. And it's typically you don't see that bad unless you spill, but if you over apply, you can see a tip burn on the, the leaf blades of the grass. And so if you're trying to recover, you're not wanting to do more damage to the grass. Um, so start with small amounts of nitrogen. And if the grass is growing fast enough, you're mowing once a week, it looks like, you know, it's healthy turf, you don't need to apply more. Um, if you still have thin spots, it doesn't look thick, it doesn't look healthy, uh, you can apply more nitrogen. Um, so it's always, you know, easier said than done to get out there and do it more often. But starting with smaller amounts, you know, tenth of a pound, quarter of a pound, half a pound, um, you know, in one application per thousand square feet of nitrogen uh, is going to be a little bit safer in these hot temperatures and allow you to still produce growth and uh, recover from the drought um, as we're in August heading into September. Um, so you may be asking yourself, you know, when I look at the bag of fertilizer, I see those three numbers. I know it stands for nitrogen phosphorus and potassium. So why does he keep saying apply nitrogen as the main um, factor of increasing growth? Um, so what I would say is take a look. There's some great publications we have. One is the AGR 244 and AGR 249 um, that explain this in a lot more detail. But basically what this map is showing you is that over the years and all the soil tests that we have reported here, looking at that, Kentucky's native soils have very abundant potassium and phosphorus. Um, so in a, in a home lawn situation, in a turf grass situation around the state, um, you can almost bet on it that if you were to just apply potassium, you would see no response from the turf grass, whether in increased yield or increased color. And the same with phosphorus, you're likely would see no benefit. Um, and you can also, typically find just straight nitrogen sources are your, your cheapest fertilizer. Uh, so the turf grass doesn't care how much your fertilizer costs. Um, all it cares about is getting the food it needs. Um, so if you have abundant, your soil tests come back, you're fine on potassium, you're fine on phosphorus, um, then you don't need to buy a fertilizer that has those. Um, so economical as well as environmental benefits by not applying those those um, nutrients to the soil. Um, I'd also say, as, as we're talking about renovating our lawns, restarting our lawns, um, a lot of us are probably going to be reseeding certain areas that didn't survive the drought, um, whether that be small or establishing a whole new lawn. Um, when you walk down the, the shelves of your grocery store, or your hardware store, you're often going to see a fertilizer that says, you know, in big letters on the front, starter fertilizer. Um, so we could talk about that, but uh, actually Dr. Brad Lee did a talk last year um, and he did a very good job explaining why typically we don't need to apply phosphorus, um, which is high in starter fertilizers. So try to avoid starter fertilizers as you're recovering from the drought this fall um, and go back and watch that. 
Um, so here we're looking at uh, drought stress. Oops, sorry. Um, and you can see here, this is a UK on uh, July 7th. And this year we see the grass on the left, um, com almost completely dormant, very little green in there. And then you come back uh, July 28th, not even a month later, and you have really great recovery there. Uh, almost the entire area is green back up. Uh, there's no irrigation applied there. And it's come back to where it, where it needs to be. Uh, we have a few weed problems, a few thin spots there, um, but often you don't have to do anything to recover. Uh, just be patient and, and wait for adequate rain to supply your needs there. Um, so that's typical, but sometimes rain is a day late and a dollar short. Um, so we see here another picture I took of this uh, turf grass on July 7th, and the whole area is almost completely dormant. And um, then July 28th again, we see that it's largely greened up, but we have a pretty large area there that's really thin in the middle. Um, so typically um, an area like that, you're, you're gonna have to do something to, to reestablish that. And so at that point, I would uh, consider seeding. Um, so here's another picture on UK's campus and you can see uh, a pretty large patch there that has no green grass in it. Uh, probably just a few weeds there. Um, so I would say if it's less than 50% of the turf grass is desirable um, in your lawn or in the area that you're looking at, you want to consider seeding. Um, so you want to consider um, overseeding into those areas to establish that uh, because water and nitrogen alone are not likely going to recover an area that's that, that's that large. So it's not all, all bad news. If you have areas that need to be reseeded, reestablished, um, it's an opportunity for you to choose new improved turf grass varieties. Um, so companies, uh, breeders every single year are improving the turf grass varieties that we have. Um, so general recommendation when you're talking about a turf grass for a lawn um, is to just don't buy Kentucky 31 tall fescue. Um, it has fits, it's very cheap, but you also are getting what you pay for. Um, research plots out here at Kentucky have shown um, that it doesn't hold up to the drought stress. You can find pictures all online. It's typically a clumpy, thick bladed grass, and it doesn't do well in the summers here. Um, we have much, much better grasses available to us now. Um, so if you're going reseeding, it's opportunity to um, choose a grass variety uh, that will improve your lawn and make it uh, need less water and more drought tolerant years to come. Uh, so here's a picture of side by side of Kentucky 31, the light green on the left, and a turf type tall fescue on the right. Um, so across the state of Kentucky, generally the best grass for any lawn is a turf type tall fescue. Even though we are the bluegrass state, uh, Kentucky bluegrass is not the best grass for us to do. To plant here, it's not as drought tolerant as turf type tall fescue. Um, so you can see here in this picture, um, there's Kentucky bluegrass surrounding a few patches of green, and those patches there are tall fescue. Um, we have a few broadleaf weeds with those deep tap roots hanging onto the green color in the drought. Um, but all the bluegrass has gone dormant. The only thing that's maintaining some color is uh, the turf type tall fescue. And so a situation like that shows you if the whole stand was tall fescue, you would have a lot more green, a lot more drought resistance, less need to water. So when it comes to buying seed, um, I really recommend ignoring all of the marketing, everything on the front and turning the bag over and going straight to the tag um, to see what's in the bag. And so if you see this bag here on the left, it says grass seed Midwest mix. Um, so you may say, okay, Kentucky could possibly be in the Midwest, Southeast, I don't know, but it's here on the shelf um, at my local store. So I'm gonna buy that. 
But when you turn it over, you see it's got red fescue, ryegrass, bluegrass, um, but it doesn't have any turf type tall fescue in it. Um, so you want to look to make sure that what your plant has turf type tall fescue generally in the state of Kentucky. Um, so how much seed do I need? So you go to the store, comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, so typically the general seeding recommendations are for turf type tall fescue, six pounds per thousand. Kentucky bluegrass, two pounds, zoysia, two pounds, Bermuda grass, two pounds. I mean, it's important to remember that all these are what's called pure live seed. Um, so that's six pounds of pure live seed per thousand square feet. That's not just six pounds of the bag that you bought off the shelf. So you can see on this tag here um, to, to look what's in the bag. So if you look here, it says, uh, um, other ingredients, 51.75% inert matter, 0.25% other crop seed, and 0.01 weed seed. So over 50% of this bag is not pure live seed. Um, so that's nothing wrong with that. We see up top there that it has uh, three different varieties of tall fescue. All those are turf type tall fescue, um, which is a good thing. So this would be okay to buy. But you just want to be aware that when you're buying it, that you can't just say six pounds per thousand square feet. I'm going to seed that and take six pounds of this bag and think you're getting six pounds per thousand square feet. Um, so I won't go too in depth into this because there's a lot of good websites that you can just type in pure live seed calculation and it'll help you find that out. Um, but to give you just a, a quick example here on this tag, we see this is tall fescue. Good the variety is Falcon 4. Um, and then you want to look over to, to find out your PLS, you, which is your percent seed purity multiplied by your percent seed germination. So in this particular bag, it's 99% pure seed, um, and you multiply that by 90% germination rate, and that gives you a pure live seed uh, calculation of 0.89. So we remember that our tall fescue pure life seed rating was six pounds per thousand. You divide that by 0.89. So for this particular bag of seed, you would need 6.7 pounds of that bag per thousand square feet. Uh, now this particular tag is an extremely pure seed. Uh, when I was going through the store earlier this week and looking at the backs of the bags, I mean, those upwards of 50% were inert matter, um, you know, 80% germination rates. Um, so it, it, you're likely not to find this pure of a seed just off the shelf. Um, but you can find those calculations online and, and just keep that in mind because a lot of um, seed companies are trying to stretch that, that seed out um, to make their supply go farther. Uh, so you just want to be aware of what's in, the, what's in the bag. So when it comes time to seed, um, there's two main methods of doing this. Um, essentially, you want good seed to soil contact. Um, and, and there are several ways to do this. Small areas can just be, you know, raked in by hand, seed it, rake it in by hand, throw some straw on it, go on. Uh, but when you're talking about, you know, going over your whole lawn, uh, you typically want to use some sort of dethatcher or a slit seeder. Um, so a dethatcher, actually this picture on the right, it has blades that go down, pull up the thatch and make grooves in the soil. And then you would go behind that with the fertilizer spreader to uh, broadcast um, seed across that lawn and then water that in. Um, the slit seeder, the picture on the left here with the tubes and the discs there, uh, that's a dethatcher, but it also has a seed box on top where you can put the seed directly into it and you can dethatch and seed all in one pass, um, which uh, saves you a little time that way. And most of these things can be rent it from rental companies or um, contract it out to do. Um, but that's your two main ways and you can get unique. You can use air fires, you can use rakes, you can use um, any way you can think to poke holes in the ground to, to get a good seed to soil contact. Um, so when is the best time to seed? The best time to seed in Kentucky is September and next September. Um, that's what I always tell folks. That's what I've always heard. Um, you know, you do have a little flexibility, but the fall is the best time to seed in the state of Kentucky. And um, 
you know, it's, it's better than spring because in the fall, the days are getting shorter. You have good soil temperature to get the seed germinated to recover from the drought. Um, but you're not dealing with the hot, hot weather. Like if you plant in the spring and you're, the days are getting longer and the weather's getting hotter every day. So it's a little easier to maintain the seedlings as they germinate and, and establish to maturity. Um, so what about weed control? Um, you know, that's really a, a, not a factor of controlling the growth of our grass, like with the water and nitrogen, um, but it can outcompete the desirable turf grasses. Um, so here you see uh, two lines down the middle. This is a little bit of drought area, but two lines down the middle of the picture that are bright green, and that's because it's 100% crabgrass in there. Um, there had been truck driving through the same path, that compacted grass, and when we got a little bit of drought stress, the crabgrass just took over that. Um, so there's no desirable grass there. Those will all seed and spread, um, and, and it'll just get worse and worse year after year unless you control that. Um, so I do recommend as we go into the fall after this drought recovering is to um, treat your weeds, especially crabgrass, um, and you may think, you know, well, I'm just going to wait till the first frost kills it, uh, which is which is okay. It's green. It's fine. Um, but it, if you don't treat it, that seed can get worse and worse every year to where you have a pure crabgrass lawn. Um, so I do recommend treating your weeds before you seed reestablish this fall. Um, but a warning about spraying different herbicides on your grass around the same time that you're thinking about reseeding your grass or overseeding your grass is to always search the label. Um, so here's a, a product that's called Drive, which is quinclorlac, which is a great product for, uh, which is a great ingredient for um, crabgrass, the quinclorlac. But you see on the chart here, uh, there's very different recommendations based upon the seed. So if you were seeding Kentucky bluegrass, it's okay to spray this product before. It's not okay to spray at seeding or seven to 14 days after emergence. You can spray it again at 28 days. So there's very specific recommendations. Uh, tall fescue, turf type tall fescue, you can spray it before at seeding, seven, 14, or 28 days after emergence. Um, so if we're recommending planting tall, turf type tall fescue, and you have crabgrass issues going into the fall, that really gives you the availability to treat those weeds and get seed established all at one time. Um, so again, read those labels. Here's another label that says, do not apply to newly seeded grasses until well-established. And then you read down a little farther, it says, reseed no sooner than three to four weeks after application of this product. Um, so if you go out and spray that the first week of September, um, then you can't seed until October. Um, so it's just important to read those labels and keep those things in mind. Um, and as we get good weather, even in August, you can start spraying this crabgrass and broadleaves. Um, but you want to make sure that you always read those labels and also keep in mind the soil moisture and any heat restrictions on those labels. Um, so you may be anxious now that things are starting to green up to get back out there and treat your weeds. Um, but if you did it too early and there's not enough moisture in the soil, you'll likely be wasting the product. So here's a, a picture example of a herbicide sprayed on um, goosegrass. And the, the plant on the left there has less than 12% volumetric water content. And all those leaf blades look green and rather good. The plant on the right had 12 to 20% volumetric water content. And you see the leaves turning brown, it looks weak, it's dying, the herbicide did its work. Um, there's no difference in the herbicide, the difference was in the soil moisture. Um, and then also read those labels. A lot of times they'll say something like, uh, do not apply this product when the air temperature is above 80 degrees, 85 degrees. Um, so you just want to be careful, you know, not to go out on a 90 degree day trying to, to spray your weeds and end up knocking back your desirable grass more. Uh, another warning is to look um, again at the back of the bag. Uh, you had some drought, you had a bunch of crabgrass pop up, and you go to the store, you see the front of this bag, it says crabgrass control. Great, I'm going to use that. I have crabgrass, I want to control it. Uh, you, 
throw that in the fertilizer spreader and go out. And then you go to try to seed um, this September and nothing comes up from your seed. Well, it's because you applied a pre-emergent herbicide. This is the five peer. Um, so you just wanna be really careful if you're planning on reseeding to recover from the drought that you don't apply a pre-emergent until this next spring. Um, so control your weeds with post-emergent herbicides um, and don't accidentally mess up by just rooting the front of the bag. So um, when we talk about treating broadleaf weeds, crabgrass is one thing, typically, a, you know, it's a summer annual or treating it. Um, but when it comes to broadleaf, broadleaf weeds, uh, remember spring is better than summer, but fall is best of all. Um, so the good thing about spraying in fall is that you can typically kill your winter annuals, uh, your hen, henbit, your purple dead nettle, and you can also kill your perennials at one shot. So two birds with one stone. Um, and this often eliminates that spring dandelion flush. Um, for years, I would go and spray dandelions. Soon as I saw them, you know, in the spring, it'd knock them back down, um, but it never killed them completely and they'd pop back up. Um, but if you spray in the fall, and, and the recommendation is around the average first frost. So in the state of Kentucky, we're looking somewhere, you know, beginning to mid-October of our first frost. And it doesn't have to be a hard killing frost, um, but you, that's kind of a, a, a recommended timing. And you can look for those young winter annuals that have germinated um, and that dandelion and other broadleafs are a whole lot more likely to um, take that herbicide down into the roots and give it a, a lethal kill um, and preventing that spring dandelion flush. And so, and, and you can spray, you know, all the way up to Thanksgiving or better here in the state of Kentucky, you know, as long as the, the soil is not frozen, if you get a good sunny day, um, go out and hit those broadleafs to control those. Um, but again, check your labels to make sure you, whatever you seed it is already established. So if you seed in 1st of September, you know, hopefully by October, it's, it's well established before you need to uh, treat any weeds that have come up um, that you might have pulled seeds up when you, when you seed it. So some less traditional lawn options for the state of Kentucky. Um, it, and it may be something to really consider as you're talking down in Western Kentucky. Uh, this was the drought map from, you know, end of July there. Um, but you can see down in far western Kentucky, they missed a lot of those rains, unfortunately. Um, but warm season grasses handle drought better. Um, so one of those warm season grasses that you can choose in the state of Kentucky is zoysia grass. Um, I particularly like this one because it's very cold tolerant. Um, so we can get some very harsh winters, but we also get some harsh summers here. Um, being in the transition zone. So zoysia grass can um, withstand those, those conditions in the state. You just want to be careful, talk to agents about the best uh, varieties to choose. Um, can be seeded. It can also be sod, sprig, you know, vegetatively planted. Um, but it can also be a very beautiful low input lawn. So zoysia grass typically grows fairly slow, um, but you see on the picture there, it is a really nice stand of grass, um, require, doesn't require much mowing, um, saves your money when gas is $5 a gallon and you don't have to mow as often. Um, but one of the downsides is the winter dormancy. So you see the picture there on the right and that's uh, typically what a zoysia grass lawn will look like in the winter. So we start getting that first hard frost, uh, the grass will slowly lose color um, until it goes fully dormant in the winter. Um, but the next spring it greens back up. So benefits of that is when you're typically using the lawn the most in the summertime, it's very healthy, it's not dormant, like often a cool season grass will go during drought um, and you have it when you want it. Um, so that's one, one option for a warm season grass. Another warm season grass is Bermuda grass. Um, so compared to zoysia grass, it's not as cold tolerant, but there are improved varieties that are more cold tolerant. Um, we have it here in, in Lexington. Um, there, you know, it's not uncommon to see it, um, but a benefit of Bermuda grass is that it is more drought resistant than zoysia grass. Um, so during the, the prolonged periods of drought, it will maintain the green color longer than zoysia will when it comes to the warm season grasses. 
Um, another downside of Bermuda grass is that it also goes dormant in the winter. Um, but you, when you get some frost, you can get some really crazy fun patterns like this uh, leopard print uh, frost pattern here on the right for a little bit. Um, and finally, last of all, this is not a recommendation, but some of you all may just really enjoy experimenting. Um, I've never seen this done in a home lawn, but it's what they call blue muda. Um, so this is a picture of Danville Country Club in Boyle County, and they've had this um, for probably six or seven years now, but they had Bermuda grass fairways and they seeded bluegrass seed into the, the stand of Bermuda grass. Um, so is this the perfect solution for the transition zone? Uh, you know, Dr. AJ Powell said we can grow warm season and cool season grasses equally poor. Um, so do we try to grow them both together? Um, once, like I said, again, I've, I've never seen this done in a home lawn, but uh, if anybody's wanting to experiment, I'd love to see it. Um, so that concludes my presentation. If anybody has any questions, that's my email. You can find me on Twitter and uh, appreciate their time today.